I'm here with Maria from our partner Philanthropy in Serbia. I'm Amy and I work in the comms team here at Christian Aid. And I first met Maria about a year ago today um, and I was visiting the work of our Act Alliance partner Philanthropy in Serbia. Philanthropy have been responding to the refugee situation in Serbia since June 2015. Maria, when I met you a year ago now, the situation was quite different to the one that we see today. Can you tell us about um, how the situation for refugees has changed? Yes, um, when you were in Serbia last year, we were having thousands and thousands of people coming to Serbia, transiting Serbia each day. Uh, as of at the beginning of March this year, the borders in the European countries uh, had closed which actually means that the number decreased, uh, but people are actually staying longer. So we are currently having in between 150 and 300 new entries every day. We are having a bit more than 6,000 people in the camps all around Serbia and several thousand people staying uh, outside, mostly in Belgrade, staying outside of camps, um, staying for, at least as for now, staying for the indefinite amount of time. And so with borders across Europe closed, can you say something about how it is that people are still able to arrive in Serbia every day and the conditions that you're seeing people arrive in? Yes, the, the closure of the borders actually made, made their situation quite complicated. Uh, as the borders are closed, that actually means for them that they're not allowed to cross them, uh, which actually uh, get to the situation that the criminal activities have increased significantly. So the only solution these people have now is to be exposed to human traffickers and smugglers. So they are actually having uh, to pay to be able to continue their journey. So they are either packed in vans or they are being transported in uh, cargo wagons or uh, being packed uh, above the wheels of the big lorries. Uh, they're oftentimes being dropped out by smugglers in the middle of the forest and uh, hopefully what is the best solution, at least for the case in Serbia, is that the police finds them, collects them and bring them to the camps. So um, I would say that the situation has been deteriorating constantly ever since the closure of the borders. We are seeing people who have been severely ill, um, uh, quite hopeless, uh, they've been exposed to different types of criminal activities, um, uh, having a different type of st types of diseases, scared, so um, it's a really, really difficult situation for them now. A year ago when I uh, was on the border with Macedonia, with yourself and your colleagues, there was a sense of uh, hopefulness that people had finally managed to um, escape after enduring years of conflict and and people were, were relieved that they were um, heading towards a place of safety and sanctuary. Can you describe how you have seen people's well-being and psychological state change during the year, particularly now that the borders are closed and that people are not able to continue with their, with their journey and don't really know what to expect for their futures? Yes, yes, you are absolutely right. And as you probably remember, faces that you were able to see a year ago and faces that we have been seeing for quite a long period of time were faces of hope and the faith that the end, that there is an ending to the misery that they are experiencing. Unfortunately, the, the situation that uh, is uh, currently happening in Serbia has changed that. Uh, people are, uh, as I said, the, the reason for them leaving their homes is the conflict and the wars that they cannot do anything about. But the journey that they have been experiencing traveling through Europe uh, actually worsens their condition. Instead of um, being able to travel safely and reach the final destination in a safe manner, uh, these people are again fighting for their lives. Uh, again have um, to um, cope with different types of um, actions that directly violate uh, the digni their basic dignity. There are oftentimes, there are quite a lot of testimonies of rape, kidnapping of children. Um, so even the ones who did not experience that by themselves have seen that or have families or have family members or friends that have experienced that. So by the time they reach Serbia, Unfortunately, most of the people uh, feel quite hopeless, which is really devastating, I, I would say. And I think that's one of the things that Europe need to uh, rethink again of 
how we are actually responding to the disastrous conditions that these people are facing, contributing to the problems they already had. So philanthropy has been responding to the situation since June 2015. How has the work of your organisation changed over that time as, as the needs and the situation on the ground has also changed? Well, yes, uh, as, as you mentioned, at the very beginning people were transiting Serbia, which meant that they wouldn't stay for longer than maybe two days. So at the very beginning, the basic activities that we were conducting and the assistance we were providing was just distributing canned food, uh, some clothing that was according to the weather conditions, um, some baby items as well, but it was like really uh, quick, direct humanitarian assistance as the needs are completely different now because people are staying now for months and the pe people who are staying currently in Serbia have been in Serbia for quite a long time and will be staying for a longer time. We are trying to slowly um, broaden the scope, the assistance that we are having and include different types of occupational activities which would actually enable them to do something while they are staying in Serbia. It's a quite complex situation because they are in a limbo stage this is not their final destination, but they have to do something. So we try to engage them as much as possible, either as interpreters or in distribution teams, or in doing different types of crafts work, uh, which would make them feel um, fruitful and productive members of society. However, the basic needs are still there. So Serbia as a country is not capable of providing all the needed assistance. So food is highly needed, personal hygiene items, as I mentioned, uh, these people have been staying in forests out of civilization for days or even weeks. So uh, we need, by the time they reach the camps in Serbia, they need new clothing, they need personal hygiene items, they need proper showers. Um, small children are particularly vulnerable, of course, so we are trying to provide different types of items for them. Um, but as I said, the situation is quite complex and is changing constantly. Luckily, we will be. We we have been able to be quite flexible and respond to the needs so far. And of course, it's now winter in Serbia, and it gets very cold in Serbia. Can you say something about the particular needs of people? Um, what is the shelter like that people are staying in, and how is philanthropy and other organisations supporting people? Um, during very bitterly cold weather, I imagine. Yes, the winters on the Balkans are quite harsh. We have very low temperatures, below minus 10 degrees centigrade. We have lots of snow and a lot of wind, so the winter, winterization assistance is always crucial. So um, <clears throat> uh, there are lack of um, non-food items available, so proper clothing. In cases where there are some clothing, there is only one item per person, so one pair of socks or one pair of underwear, which is of course not sufficient. So we are in a really high need of providing proper clothing, proper boots and shoes, especially for children. They have to go out, we can't keep the children inside the camps. Um, so these are really uh, especially important. What is also has what, is, what has also been stressed, particularly by doctors, is um, proper nutrition. So we need uh, more fruit, more fresh salad, so more food that is based on vitamins in order to avoid massive epidemic of flu uh, or other diseases that can be caused by coldness. And um, for those people who um, who won't see what you have have seen over the course of the last year and obviously you've spent a lot of time on, on the borders meeting people as they arrive. Who are you seeing arriving in terms of are there lots of families, are there, are there lots of children arriving? What's Yes, yes. Uh, most of the people that we have currently uh, based in Serbia are from Afghanistan, Syria and Iraq and the vast majority of them are families. We have uh, quite a lot of women travelling by themselves with five, seven kids, especially families from Iraq, Yazidi families and Kurdish families. Uh, we have quite a few people with disabilities, uh, people that have been wounded during the war conflicts as well. Um, approximately 50% of all the people that are staying in Serbia are children under the age of 18. Um, there uh, are a lot of newborn babies as well. Uh, we have new ones almost every day. Uh, so the needs are there, so a lot of pregnant women traveling as well, so 
uh, yes, it's a quite diverse group of people. I know also as well that there are um, young boys who are who are travelling alone, who are unaccompanied and, and under the age of 18. And I know that philanthropy is doing some work to support young boys. Can you say something about um, the work that philanthropy is doing? Yes, young boys are, I would say, probably one of the most vulnerable categories because they are oftentimes perceived as single men who are traveling alone, which is actually not fair because these are teenagers who are actually, uh, they are traveling in groups because this is their method to keep, keep themselves safe uh, jointly. Uh, it, it actually happened that family, we talked to so many of them, actually families, like the relatives, the wider families, managed to collect a certain amount of money and send at least one child away from the war zone. These are teenagers, teenagers like any other teenager, who are really scared and that, uh, quite often are not perceived as children, uh, which would quite often, unfortunately, leave them out of the, the available assistance. Uh, they are uh, very uh, open, they are more than interested in uh, getting engaged and getting involved in assisting other people living in the camp and agencies working in the camp. So we have developed different types of activities that would actually, as at least we hope, um, help them cope with the situation that they are in. So we do provide different types of direct assistance for them, but we also engage them in uh, as I said, is interpretation, or they organize different kind of art exhibitions, or they uh, define different types of cultural events for the others present in the camp. Uh, they offer their assistance to single moms uh, when they cannot or they don't feel uh, really comfortable uh, leaving the camp by themselves. Um, and they are so grateful. They are very grateful for any kind of activity that can engage them and make their life uh, and, li and day living in, in this camp uh, more fulfilled. We know that um, there's more than 66,000 places that have been pledged for relocation um, for people, but we know that to date only a few thousand have actually been, been relocated and that uh, in Serbia and Greece and other parts of Europe, people are effectively stranded, like you're like you're describing. In addition to the humanitarian support that your organisation is providing, what do you think needs to happen uh, on an advocacy and campaigning level in order to to bring about a real change to this situation that's largely out of the news? I think now. Yes, yes. Uh, somehow this topic is under the radar, and I think uh, it's uh, really important to put it back in for several reasons. So first of all, uh, the wording that has been used in the last uh, year has been quite wrong. So we can oftentimes hear this, the phrase refugee crisis, which is commonly understood as a crisis caused by the refugees, which is not true and it's not fair. Uh, these people do not cause the crisis. They are the consequence of the crisis that is caused by somebody else. And they feel that kind of animosity coming from the Europeans. And they tell us, like, this is not fair, this is not what we wanted, this is not our fault and we should not be the one to be blamed. So I think we need to rethink again of the proper wording, we need to go back to the basic humanity in all of us and acknowledge that there are people uh, next to us that are exposed to really difficult situations and they need our help, they need our assistance and we are in a position, but just in this given moment, it can change very easily. We are in a position that we can help them. And it th I think it's way beyond the legal duty, it's a moral duty of all of us to do that. So uh, we need to create an atmosphere of um, productive environment that can support the ones that need support. I think that's one of the things that we need to be aware of and work a bit more. And the other thing that I would like to stress is, we mentioned it uh, at the very beginning of our conversation, is the increase of criminal activities in Europe. Closure of borders actually um, caused the pouring of huge amounts of money into the, into the hands of the criminals, and the worst possible criminals we can think of. So these people are not only smuggling people, they are also smuggling weapons and drugs. And I think it's, uh, it's uh, really important for Europe to be aware of that because 
this will affect us, all of us, I'm quite sure. Uh, supporting this kind of uh, structures in the middle of the Europe uh, in the 21st century will definitely or should definitely not be allowed by um, uh, by the decision makers and the advocacy actors as well. So we need to revise the whole concept of um, who the guilty ones are, who the ones in need are, who can be the providers of the assistance, what would be the best, best possible mechanisms and to define some other types or platforms of assistance that would be more fair both to the refugees and people in movement but also for the people in Europe who are coping with this situation. And Maria, how have the people of Serbia responded to the situation in the country and how do you think Serbia's own history of conflict has, has impacted upon the response of the country? Yes, I think Serbia is quite a specific country. We have been having a war quite recently and during the 1990s, so the total population of Serbia is 7 million people and national sanctions in addition to that, and we coped. So um, the, the response of common people in, in Serbia is quite clear because we all do remember the tragic events that have, were happening in our, our own country. So there is a really strong um, uh, standing within the general population of Serbia. And we, even in, in the media and the government, avoids using the terms such as refugee or asylum seeker or um, migrant. We tend to define these people as people in need. And the response, uh, the assistance is available for all. So for all of these people who end up on the territory of Serbia, they have been provided assistance. The government provides and manages the camps. Uh, all of these people have free medical care assistance, social welfare assistance, aid agencies uh, work in the camps providing other types of assistances. So, so far it was uh, quite supportive and quite good and I am truly proud of my people for that, yes. Thank you. Thanks to, to Maria and Philanthropy for the work that they were doing in response to the refugee situation in Europe. This year, our Christmas appeal is supporting communities who have been displaced from their homes around the world owing to conflict. And if you would like to support the kind of work that Maria and her colleagues are doing, then we would love you to support our Christmas appeal, Light the Way. Thanks for joining us.